We discuss charisma today on Dungeon Craft. Welcome to Dungeon Craft. I'm Professor Dungeon Master, and this channel is about playing the ultimate game of D&D and other role-playing games. And I'm Deathbringer. Level up your game by subscribing and click the bell icon so you'll be informed when we upload new videos every week. I recently polled my patrons and asked them of the original six ability scores, which do you think can go? And the overwhelming favorite to be rejected from the game was Charisma. Social and mental stats like Charisma, Intelligence, Wisdom, it's always tricky to handle them because what if the player character is more charismatic than the player playing them? Corey at Taking 20 does a great job of covering this in his episode, Why Do We Handle Charisma Backwards?, in which he postulates there's pretty much two camps when it comes to handling charisma. Now, the first, we'll call it Camp A, is the most common. This is the dungeon master asks the player to narrate what they say, and then they call for a charisma check. And the problem with this is it penalizes people who are introverted or not really as charismatic as their 18 Charisma Paladin is. The other option, version B, is you roll the dice and then narrate to see what happens, just like you do when you roll to hit a monster. This method does not penalize players who are not as charismatic as their role-playing avatars. But on the other hand, it allows players to kind of skip the role-playing sections, right? By just saying, well, I'm going to make a deception roll. I got an 18 or I got a 20. I can now skip this encounter. And that's why a lot of old-school dungeon masters don't like it. Now, in my opinion, both camps are correct from a logical point of view. On one hand, you don't expect your players to be as strong or as dexterous or as wise as their player characters. But on the other hand, it's a role-playing game, and role-playing should be encouraged. And social encounters really test the player characters' ingenuity and acting skills, and that's a big part of the game. And it's what makes these games different than, say, video games. If I'm running for a group of introverted teenagers, I might just call for a role, because they want to skip mostly to the combat anyway. But if I'm running for experienced players and I want to encourage role playing, I'll still call for a role, but it'll be a much lower threshold and I'll really carefully consider what they say prior to setting the difficulty. The problem here is the underlying premise that a role playing game, if it's well designed, can create a, a bunch of consistent rules that, that can consistently simulate both real world physics and interpersonal relationships. I don't believe that that can actually happen. That's not a thing. And so any kind of role-playing game will for, fall short, and it'll be up to the game master's discretion, and that's okay, because that's what you have a game master for. Now, whether you favor A or B, the most important question you as a game master can ask is, is a role even necessary? In many cases, the answer is going to be no. Non-player characters in my games will have default responses and a range of responses that will determine if that role is truly necessary. For example, the classic, can the player characters trick their way past the guard and get an audience with the king? My response to that is no, because the default position of a guard is to say no. They're not supposed to let people past a certain point. That's what they do. Their whole existence hinges on that, and most of them are military officers, and they are trained to follow orders without questioning. That's how guards work. This die has 20 sides. It's going to come up natural 20, one out of 20 rolls. Now, let's say 20 of my closest friends, we all go up to Buckingham Palace and we try to bluff our way or deceive the guards into letting us in and seeing the Queen. Is that likely to happen? One out of 20 times? I submit to you, it is not. There is a 0% chance. I could be Mick Jagger, who is a knight, and he's not going to be able to get in to see the Queen Mother. That's not even inconsistent with the rest of the other ability scores. Would you allow a player to move a mountain if they rolled a natural 20 on a strength test? Of course not. There are some things that are just impossible. A guard's default position is going to always be to say no. Can the characters roll a natural 20 and convince the king to give up his crown? No, his default position is he is the king. Can the characters convince Thor to give up his hammer for a little while so they can defeat some storm giants? 
No, that's not even a thing because uh, Thor is a god. He is used to being worshipped. Other NPCs will have a wider range of default responses. Consider a merchant. Will the merchant haggle over the price of oil or rope? When they see the adventurers coming, they're going to be like, oh, here's a group of adventurers again. They're used to haggling a certain amount, and they probably have it in their mind. I'm going to come down as much as 10% for these people so that they think that they got something at a cheaper price. Now, will a master sword maker lower their prices? I would say probably not, because they are a skilled artisan that spends weeks working on a single product, and if the player characters don't buy it, they can wait a little longer and find someone who will pay for that quality. If the player characters flirt with the serving wench, is she likely to date one of them? Well, this has probably happened a number of times, like all day, every day. How good looking is this guy? How much money does he have? And what are her prospects? Is this a dumpy town? Is he the best thing that's going to come along? Or is it a prosperous city where she can do better for herself with a more stable guy? And just because the player rolls 18, 19, or 20 to flirt with her doesn't mean that she's automatically going to engage in carnal relations. She might just say, okay, I'll, I can go for a walk with you tomorrow morning around the town square. Imagine a sliding scale, and for relationships, you don't go all the way to the end of the scale with one charisma check. You move one little bit. Now, everyone, NPCs, their sliding scale could be different and have more steps, but if you imagine steps and multiple checks are necessary, that's, I think, more like how real life works. Now, everyone always wants more specific details, so let's look at a scenario. This is Power Behind the Throne. It is a scenario for the Warhammer Fantasy roleplay game, and although it's not D&D, it is useful because it is almost entirely roleplaying. In this 96-page scenario, the player characters have to ingratiate themselves in the royal court of Graf Boris Toddbringer and unravel a conspiracy that threatens the entire city. The scenario plays out during an annual eight-day carnival. Players have opportunities to meet key NPCs at various events, such as archery tournaments, minotaur fights, plays, concerts, and there are 22 major NPCs in total and only three combat encounters. I've run this scenario four times, and in the early run-throughs, when the characters would see a major NPC like Lorraine LaFarrell, who is the court minstrel, I'd say, well, you see him, what do you say? And I would get stammering and hums and haws. So in subsequent sessions, I've said, okay, you see Lane LaFarrell, you want to go up and talk to him? Yes? Okay, you start making small talk. The default position for Lorraine is he's extremely friendly and gregarious. I mean, he's a minstrel after all. He will talk to anyone who likes talking about music or drinking. Now, this is how I would do a charisma check. I'd set the number at 11, and if the player characters roll an 11 or better, Lorraine will invite them to another event where he will introduce them to one of his friend NPCs, like Alevandro Fanmaris, the Master of the Hunt, or Dieter Schmeidenhammer, the Graf's champion. If they fail the roll, he will thank them for a good time and he'll say maybe I'll catch you later the next day the player characters might find him in another event and because they're a familiar face they can start up a new conversation and begin that process again Dieter Schmeidenhammer's position as Graf's champion requires him to fight three or four barring matches a day and whoever wins gets to be the Graf's champion for the next year. It's probably likely that the player characters are going to enter, but even if they lose, he is going to have a lot of respect for them. He'll help them up off the ground and say, hey, I'm sorry I hit you so hard, buddy. What say I buy you a beer? Failing a charisma check might mean Dieter excuses himself, saying he has to wake up early for tomorrow's match. Success means he will introduce them to his friends. Another critical character is Petra Liebkos, and she is a lady of the court. She's charming, flirty, funny, and a great conversationalist. That's her default. She's also materialistic, so she will respond more positively if a character buys her gifts, lowering the charisma check DC. Success means she gives them critical information about what's really going on, and she knows a lot of stuff. Failure means she withholds information until she gets another gift. One role shouldn't determine success or failure in a, in a political intrigue adventure like this. We would never hinge a combat on a single to hit role, so why do we hinge social encounters on single charisma checks? In real life, sometimes we don't like people on our initial first encounter with them, but we warm to them with time, and it should be the same thing in the role-playing world, I think. Now, how do you handle charisma? I'd love to hear about it in the comments section below. 
below. Also below, you'll find a link to our Patreon where you can get all sorts of stuff, including the Eldritch Rules Light horror RPG scenarios and the beta version of my own hacked version of D&D. Once again, for Dungeon Craft, this has been Professor Dungeon Master. Thanks so much for spending this time with me. I'll see you next time, and until then, may all your charisma checks be 20s. Deathbringer again. You know who has charisma? Seth Skorkowski which is why he has more subscribers, and I hear he pays his NPCs a lot more. So if you're not watching him, click on more Dungeon Craft.